morning, church. I love praising God with you. That's the highlight of my week. And uh, I am fired up about today, part two in apologetics. I'm already getting great feedback. Some of you going, I just had some of those encounters just this week about culture and how it wants to just have these shades of gray and how it's, it, it's, it's so amazing. Pastor, you were just talking about this, and I see the, the shifting and the erosion, and it's everywhere. And I was like, yes, I'm so glad God is still speaking through his word, and God will do that. In fact, I want to share an opening story with you that is so profound, it's perfect for what we're talking about today. A minister, a Boy Scout, and a computer expert walk onto a plane. <laughs> Stop me if you've heard this one. <laughs> okay, so we've got a minister, a pastor type, right? a Boy Scout, and a computer expert. And they walk onto a plane, and they're the only pastors on this small plane. And an hour into the flight, the pilot comes racing out of the cockpit, and he says, I've got horrible news. This plane is doomed. This plane is going down. And to make matters worse, for the four of us, there's only three parachutes. <laughs> I love this one. So the pilot says, you know, I'm the pilot. I got you this far safely, and hopefully you'll be okay. But I got a wife and three young kids, and I got to go. And he grabbed the parachute, and he jumped out of the plane. Well, the, the computer expert, the computer whiz, who's, who's a genius, looks at the, the remaining pastors and says, well, I'm definitely taking one of the parachutes because I'm the smartest guy in the world. And everyone knows they need me. I'm going to come up with cures and plan software and have all kinds of things to make your life so much better. As the smartest guy in the world, I hereby decree I am taking a parachute. And he grabs a pack, and he jumps out the plane. And that just leaves the Boy Scout and the pastor. So the, the minister pastor looks at the Boy Scout and with a sad smile, he says, son, you are young and I have, I have lived my life and I know where I'm going. So I want you to take the remaining parachute. I will go down with the plane. And the Boy Scout just smiles and says, relax, reverend. That smartest guy in the world just picked up my Boy Scout backpack and jumped out the plane. <laughs> We're good to go. We've got plenty of parachutes. <laughs> Which points the wisdom of the ages. There is a huge difference between man's intelligence and godly wisdom. Anybody know anybody who's got so much intelligence but they, no sense to come in out of the rain? You know people like that? It's, it's incredible. I mean, I've got some in my family like that. Not my immediate family, of course, but, you know, family. You know what? Disregard that last sentence, okay? There's, there is such a huge difference between godly wisdom and, and, and man's attempt at having intelligence. And if you don't have a firm foundation of godly wisdom, whew, if you don't have a firm apologia to stand on, I promise you, you will be easily swayed. Make no mistake about it, the culture, this secular culture is working against you. They will not applaud you in your efforts to become more like Christ. It's not going to happen. And we know that. It's foretold. It's okay. I mean, it's not okay, but it's okay. We understand where the secular society is coming from. Maybe you've noticed it. I certainly have. The growing antagonism that is coming towards people of faith. The growing antagonism, especially of followers and disciples of Jesus. If you haven't noticed, maybe you're not looking around because it is everywhere. And again, it's not a surprise. This was foretold. Paganism, occultism, even your run-of-the-day atheism seems so much more outright and encouraged and in, in, in your face. You, you just look around. I found this just this week, advertisements on billboards that say things like this. Hey, you don't believe in God? Join the club. And we're proud of this. It's okay. The church of reason. Or this one right here that's even a little bit more in your face. Just skip church. It's all fake news. Do you honestly believe that billboard would fly just 20 years ago? 30 years ago. But not a chance. When the best sellers, when you go to bookstores, are these right here that sell 2 million copies, the God delusion, and God is not great. When they stay on the bestseller list, you know the culture is standing against you. It is changing. Just this week, I read an article from Simmons College in Boston, Massachusetts, okay? Brace yourself. This came from the Anti-Oppression Library Guide at Simmons College. It says this, microaggressions are commonplace. These are verbal or behavioral indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, so it doesn't matter if you meant to do this or not, which communicate hostile 
derogatory or negative slights in relation to the possible beliefs of others. Wait for it. Christians are especially guilty of microaggressions. When they use phrases like, God bless you after someone sneezes. When they wish someone a Merry Christmas or a Happy Easter and they don't know their faith. When they do this, they invoke oppressive systems of Christian hierarchy. The world system, the culture at large, is never neutral, church. That ocean tide is either pushing you out or pulling you in, but it is never sitting in neutral. It is not just going to sit there and let you be and live for Christ. Count on it. Remember last week, we began our building our apology with a firm foundation of faith, and we want to answer one simple question. There will come a time, hopefully it's already happened for you, where you must decide, will we trust man's ever-changing truth, or will we rely on God's never-changing truth? Because if you haven't come there yet in this crisis of belief, it's coming. Student at school, hear me, it's coming where you are going to be taught things that you say, that's not what I heard on Sunday. Who are you going to believe? You're going to have to make that decision. You're going to have to make that choice. Worker at, 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 at your office place, there will come a time when your boss may stretch the limits and have some shades of gray. I won't say it. Where you've got to decide, is this ethical? My character is on the line here because everybody here knows I'm a follower of Christ. Everybody here knows I'm a Christian, and they are watching me, whether I know it or not, whether I like it or not. What do I do? Am I going to cling to God's never-changing truth that's not up for a vote, or am I going to cling to man's ever-changing truth that just comes and goes? Last week, we talked about the steady erosion of absolutes. Just in case you need more evidence of the erosion of absolute truths. And I'm talking simple biblical standards and doctrines that you just assume people knew and just assume people would respect. I saw this. Here's a truth right here. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Wow. If you had told me just 10 years ago, I would have to stand here in the pulpit and explain what this truth means, I would have laughed. If you had told me simple biblical truths like this would be challenged everywhere, I would have laughed. There are places of higher learning. There are places of academia, elitism, where we are no longer supposed to refer to him as he or she as her. But now we are supposed to, in the effort of inclusion, to use gender-neutral pronouns conjugated as follows. Instead of he, him, his, himself, we should now use z, here, here's, herself, or e, m, er, ears, himself. And to use it in a sentence, z went to here, bedroom, e went to er bedroom. Lest you think I'm making this up, I got this from a very respected college, MIT. Massachusetts Institute of Technology, mit.edu. You can go look it up. I pulled this off their website yesterday. Now, here's where we're going with this. I get that the secular scientists can't stand Christ. I get that they mock you and they make fun of you. But when it creeps into the church, we got a problem, and we need to have a firm apologia. We need to be able to call a spade a spade. We need to be able to say, that's right, embrace that. That's wrong, don't embrace that. We need to be able to discern between what is truth and what is a lie. Just this week, I read an article that said, the Church of Sweden has now instructed their pastors, their clergy, to no longer refer to God as the Lord, to no longer call God our Father and to remove all references of he. In the name of inclusion, what they say, I am baffled. What do they do when they get to the Gospels and Matthew is praying the Lord's Prayer and, and Jesus is sitting here in Matthew and he's saying, our Father <laughs> who art in heaven, what do you do? Uh, don't get back to us on that. I'm not sure how you're going to rewrite that. And I kid you not, Instead of the King James Bible, there is for sale, you can Google this later, the Queen James Bible. 
And I won't even tell you about the blasphemous, offensive things that are in that. Culture is changing, but it's crept into the church. Do you know how to answer that? Do you know what to say? Do you know how to do it in such a way that it's loving? You go, look, I'm not here. I'm not. Don't shoot the messenger. This is God's word. We're not the editor. We don't get to tear out pages we like and what we don't like. His word is never changing. This is, people will reject the Christian apologia, and, and we're used to that. But now it's, they've gone on this offensive where they literally want you to be persuaded to reject what you hold dear, to reject. You're not the intolerant ones. You haven't changed. Your words are still adhering to Scripture. And when we get to the point where we exalt man's intellect above God's wisdom, we're on a disastrous, slippery slope. And we need to be aware of that. So how can so many intelligent people be mistaken? How can so many doctors and astrophysicists and all these people and scientists and astronomers, I promise it's nothing new. The devil has been deceiving people for years. Remember, I grew up with this naturalistic bias where if you kind of believed in God, well, eh, you're probably not a good scientist. As the son of a NASA scientist, my dad has one of the greatest intellects of any intellectual giant I know. And all of his training, all of his schooling, all of his multiple degrees taught him to reject the divine and to explain it from a humanistic, secular, atheistic viewpoint. I get that. But here's what happened. None of his training, none of his indoctrination, and none of mine could ever fully disprove the existence of God. In fact, if we had an open mind, we found God to be incredibly real and very provable and verifiable. If you just look around, do you have an open mind? So I bring us back to the question we start with. Will we trust man's ever-changing truth, or will we rely on God's never-changing truth? So is that as the plate, is that the table has been set, open your Bibles to Psalm 19. Psalm 19, or pull up your favorite Bible app. While you do that, let me welcome our online campus. If you're a guest and you're checking us out for the first time today, welcome. I hope God's Word will speak to you with truth and love today. Psalm 19, we're going to look at just the first four verses, and then we're going to jump around. Psalm 19, let me set the context here. This is a Psalm of David. That's basically a fancy way of saying it's a song. It has been revered and enjoyed and repeated and preserved for 3,000 years at this point. 3,000 years this song has endured. You would call it a hit. <laughs> this is a hit single being sung and being repeated 3,000 years later. And David is saying, y'all, hold on. There is apologetic truth jammed in just these first four verses. So follow along as we read this together. He begins, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. These verses, and several more that we're going to uncover in a few minutes, will declare some of the most profound truths that even modern science has not and cannot and will not disprove. In fact, if you really look at this from an observable, objective view, you will see that modern science not only confirms, but it actually amplifies everything David is talking about here. Everything he's, all these mind-blowing truths in King David's words. So if someone were to come up to you, and I tease this out on social media all week long, and ask you point blank, how can you believe there's a God? How do you know he exists? Are there any signs you can point to? You can say yes. King David would absolutely answer. He would say, I can see signs of God's existence in creation. I can see his signs everywhere. He's saying, just look up. Look around you. These are the very first words. And I love how he starts Psalm 19. Look what he says. He says, the heavens declare the glory of God. There's no preamble. He doesn't preface it. He doesn't lay out a groundwork. He simply and boldly asserts the truth that's already confirmed in his heart. He doesn't even argue it. He doesn't even lay out his apologia yet. He boldly says what his heart confirms. So I got to ask, what about you? Does your heart and your mind boldly confirm this simple truth? Can you start with that as your foundation? Is it immutable to you? Is it not up for debate? God is there. The heavens declare his glory. I think for David, the reason why he can do that is because he knows the existence of God is self-evident. He's saying, look up. Look around you. He would think it was silly for someone to walk out under the canvas of the night sky and see all of these incredible pinpoints of light and see constellations and things moving with incredible precision. And he would go, ah, it's just random. <laughs> you're an accident. Sorry you don't have any self-esteem, but you're just a random source of mutations. And wow, you kind of look a lot like me. In fact, all 8 billion of us look exactly the same. This is crazy. 
David would think it was laughable. He knows what is already confirmed. He says the world, the cosmos, the heavens are all shouting to anyone who would listen. There is a God. Paul takes us a step farther when he says this in Romans. He says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. Read that last part. So that we are without excuse. In other words, David and Paul are saying, I can see signs of God's existence in creation. And so can you. And so can anyone who will honestly and objectively look. Unless they are choosing to willfully be deceived. Psalm 8 goes on to describe this. He says this in Psalm verse uh, 3 and 4 of Psalm 8. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars that you set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? And what are human beings that you should actually care for them? When we look at the moon and we see how it controls the tides of our oceans, and the creator knew what he was doing with that, even waves don't crash the shore in vain. Even they have a purpose designed with intelligence. They drag impurities into the depths of the sea. It's nature's constant recycling chain, like a 24-hour maid service coming up, drag it down. And guess what? There's things at the bottom of the ocean that eat that stuff. It's a beautiful, constant recycling chain. And when you gaze into the night sky and you see these countless points of light and they fill this canvas of the night sky, it should boggle our minds to think that these stars will rotate and spin on their courses in such exact precision that the world's atomic clock is set by the way they move. Wrap your head around that. The world's atomic clock, our atomic clock, is set by the way stars millions of miles away move. And even scientists today have to admit that those stars have an error factor of less than three seconds per millennium. Three seconds per millennium. That's how precise and organized they are. And you tell me it was an accident, that it was random. Y'all, I have a clock in my office that not only drops three seconds per millennium, it drops three seconds a week, maybe minutes a week. And i got to go constantly do And now remember, that clock was made by an intelligent designer to do one thing, to keep time. I was like, clock, you had one job. This was all you're supposed to do. You're not, I'm not telling you to make coffee. You don't have to mow my lawn. Just keep time. And they're not even doing it. And that was human intelligence, lofty intelligence, putting all these things into practice, do it. And it still isn't as precise as what Yahweh, Elohim, has put into motion. And I look at that, and I think, to tell me that that is a just random accident, I don't have that kind of faith. Oh, me of little faith. That anyone looks at the night sky or the ocean waves or the mountain's height and not see evidence of God's creation, it's not an indictment that there's no God. That's an indictment of the person, whether it's an honest, limited perspective, whether it's willfully choosing a lack of insight or, or a lack of honesty in assessing the tangible proofs, the evidence right before their eyes, but that's not an indictment of God, which brings us to point number two, the evidence you need to have for your apologia. I can see signs of God's intelligence all over creation. There's intelligence blasted into every atom that we see. Look again at Psalm 19.1. It says this, the heavens declare the glory of God. Now, if you don't study this and you just read the English, you think, oh, that's neat. God's glory. Like, glory. He's pretty. That's not what this means. This is a Hebrew word used here that is so packed full. It actually encompasses not just his beauty, but his wisdom and his knowledge and God's intelligence and his attention to detail and his mathematical and his scientific and his architectural precision. That's what glory means here, all of which can be seen throughout creation and should move us all to wonder and amazement and awe. And yes, it should move us to a deeper faith. This is incredible. David is so on fire here. You remember last week we talked about Lee Strobel and the case for Christ and how he was a secular, atheistic, anti, anti-God in any way by his own admission reporter for the Chicago Tribune and how in his quest to disprove God and verify things, he actually found God and now he's a pastor. And he preaches the very truth he tried to destroy. And as he investigated more and more the complexity of design and creation, it blew his mind and he had a change of heart. He said, there are signs of intelligence, compelling evidence of design everywhere I look. How have I missed this? It's because he was indoctrinated and he was told that. But if you aren't told these truths from Scripture, you would easily assume 
what secular science is trying to say, which is there is no need for a God. Therefore, there isn't one. And for you to believe otherwise just means, <laughs> bless your heart, <laughs> you're a simpleton. We should pray for you, but we don't pray. So do you see where this is going? This is, this is incredible. When you see how much modern science has actually shown, it doesn't, it doesn't disprove God. It gives us more reason to believe David's words. The heavens declare God's glory, his attention to detail, his mathematical, scientific, and architectural genius. When you see that phrase literally translated from the Hebrew, it doesn't say the heavens declare the glory of God. It actually says the heavens number out the strong God. The glory of the strong God, the heavens number out. So when we look up at a distance, at the starry expanse of the night sky, or when we gaze at it through the Hubble telescope, the heavens are numbering out the glory and the intelligence of our designer God. So if you're a math person, this is for all you science and math lovers out there. I'm just going to take one mathematical example. I was taught, and perhaps you were too, that we are the result of a massive, unexplained, somehow initiated random explosion that somehow disproves the need for a God. Perhaps you were taught this too. However, this explosion had to be so finely tuned, so precise that it defies mathematical logic. The precision of the expansion of this explosion had to be on the order of 10 to the 55th power. If you're not a math person, that's a 10 followed by 55 zeros. Yeah, that's about the number I, I registered the same thing. What does that mean? Let me, let me show you what that means. That means that if this bang had launched itself just the slightest bit faster, it would have expanded too fast to allow the formation of galaxies and solar systems and planets that we see. But if the initial expansion speed had just been the tiniest bit slower, gravity would have caused it to collapse back in on itself. Either way, for it to have been just a tiny bit off Life as we know it would not have existed and formed as we have it today. The entire universe is so finely tuned to support life, it seriously obliterates the mathematical possibility that this is the result of random forces and mutations. And David knew this. He knew stuff long before we, science, knew it. When you look at this, David knew that not only the size of the earth had to be by intelligent design, he knew the position and the orbit, even the simple tilt of its axis, that 23.5 degrees tilt, had to be such a way, because if it was a few more degrees one way, we would freeze, and a few degrees other, we would burn up. Same thing with the distance from our sun. Or take, for example, the perfect combination of air that we breathe, nitrogen and oxygen. It's in the atmosphere. We breathe it every day, and it happens to be the exact mix of life that you need to prosper, and it doesn't happen on any other known planet that way. Again, it's an accident. Please don't believe that this has anything to do with a higher power. The conditions are so finely tuned for sustaining human life, nearly everything about the basic structure of the universe is balanced on a razor blade on a razor's edge, and it has to stay just there for thousands and thousands of years for us to be where we are. And I'm told I'm just an accident. Again, I apologize, but I don't have enough faith to believe that. It's easier for me to believe what God says. Look at this picture here of random clock gears. As I put this up, I've assembled some of these, and I've got them in my box, and I've got some gears. Now, I'm told that at this expansion, inorganic became organic, non-cellular became multicellular, and it just bumped into each other. And if given enough time, and if I shake it enough, I will have this given enough time. So if you boil it down to its essence, seriously, this is, this is what me and a lot of my, think, my egghead friends, this is what we talk about. But if I look in here, I can see Nope, it's still parts. Just give it time. See, time is the hero. If you can't explain it, just give it more time. Keep shaking. Keep shaking the box. And maybe, just maybe, that will somehow organize itself. Even though I started with gears and the universe didn't. Even though I have the gears ready and I've got them carved and they're designed to go, even though intelligent design came to it, this takes more faith than I have. And if you don't take my word for it, take somebody who's not a friend of the church 
the great astrophysicist Roger Penrose. And if you're not familiar with who he is, that's okay. I wasn't either until I started studying this. He is the Oxford physicist that is awarded the 1988 Wolf Prize. He is in the top 10 the- uh, theoretical physicists in the world. His work in general relativity, alongside his partner, Stephen Hawking, earned him the Wolf Prize, one of the most prestigious in all of academia. These two worked together on general relativity and were awarded the highest prize. This scientist concluded, after looking at all the elements of the universe, this. Read his quote with me. If we combined all the laws that must be perfectly fine-tuned for life to exist as it does, we couldn't even write that number in full, since it would require more zeros than the number of elementary particles in the universe. Simply put, the first evidence for a designer is the fine-tuning of the universe, which is best explained by a cosmic fine-tuner, a.k.a. God. What he's saying is a box implies there was a box maker. A piece of furniture implies there was a furniture maker. And a world implies there was a world maker. For us to do otherwise is deceiving ourselves, which leads us to our last point. I could see signs of God's care all throughout creation. You could see his care. The same David who wrote, the heavens declare the glory of God, wrote more about this in Psalm 8. He said, oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You've set your glory above the heavens. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, all this you've set in place, and then you make him ruler over the works of your hands, You put everything under our feet, the flocks, the herds, the beasts, the fields, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, everything that swims in the seas. Lord, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. David marveled at this, at God's care that was evident in creation. He created numberless stars, yet he creates you and me. He goes and oversees the paths of all their planets on their trajectories, and yet he watches your tiny footprints. He does all these things. He watches all these massive heavenly bodies and has established his sovereignty over all. And then he gives you and I dominion to run his planet. This is incredible. Think about this. The fact that the creator willingly did this and lowered himself and became a man, descended down to us to interact with us. Church, that should build your faith. That's astounding to me. The enormity of God's Descension to us reveals his incredible care for us. That is so powerful. The enormity of of the way he descends and comes to be with us shows the extent of his care for us. I think I have that, Ryan. You want to put that up so they can write that down? Psalm 33, 6 declares this. The Lord merely spoke and the heavens were created. He simply breathed the word and all the stars were born. The star-breathing God is what Louis Giglio calls him. The same master creator who created this view from earth. The same master creator who created this view of our solar system. Just one tiny one. Just the little one. The same master creator who created this raging ball of ferocious fire knows your name. And for a little context of how, how much he thinks of us, You are there, (laughs) earth to scale. We're not that close, but that's the size of it, and we're just a speck on it. Yet of all the things he creates, at the end of time, he says, I will make my dwelling with them. Behold, I'm making all things new. And he chooses to descend and live with us after the millennial reign. Wrap your head around that. That is God's care. That is so, and this, this is the God who literally breathed it out of nothing. The Latin term is ex nihilo. He breathed this out. Of, he didn't start with building blocks. He didn't get to go put some things together. Oh, I found this. See, we never create. We make. We take wood and we fashion it into something else. But we never can take zero and fashion it into something. Y'all remember the, the funny story I told? It was, I think, three years ago in our very first sermon series together, God Quest about the atheist who was mad at God for creating life the way he did, and he challenged him to a life duel. Y'all remember this? Oh, I'll tell you, if you haven't remembered this, this is great. He comes up and he says, God, I can make life just as good as you. And God, being gracious, says, go for it, my child. So he comes and he says, oh, you go first, God. God says, 
Fair enough. And God does what we know he does in Genesis. He reached down and he scoops up a handful of dirt and he begins to fashion it into a man. And just as he's beginning to breathe life into the first Adam, that nephesh, the atheist gets angry and huffs at him. Says, I can't believe you're doing that. <laughs> that same old trick. Watch how it's done. And the atheist goes to scoop up a handful of dirt. And God says, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. What are you doing? I'm getting ready to start making life. And he goes, oh, no, 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 no. I made that dirt. You get your own dirt. I... I made that out of nothing. Good luck. Think about that. When science thinks they come up with ways of creating life, they still take God's existing amino acids and proteins and cold traps and zap it with lightning. All of this intelligent design goes into creating all these things, and when they finally get a spark, they go, we did it. It's like, oh, but that was not random at all. Look at all your science and all that you had to do and have just right, and that's... That disproves your own point. What are you thinking? The same God who breathed the stars into existence with the power of his word cares for you. And his word tells you that. But if the vastness of all that and the vastness of everything you see doesn't do it for you, then let me leave you with going the other way. Let's go to the smallest part. Probably one of the greatest discoveries of the past century is this right here, DNA. If you're not familiar with DNA, all it does is it simply stores information in the human body for the processing of protein. The average body is said to contain roughly 100 trillion cells. 100 trillion cells in just you, okay? Just one person. If you took the DNA of just one cell out of that 100 trillion, just one cell, if you took the DNA and uncoiled it, it is said to be roughly nine feet long. Nine feet. If you multiply that out towards the 100 trillion cells, someone did the math on this. If we took that DNA of just you, just the average adult, and strung it together and uncoiled it, it would go from here to where do you think? Siler City? The moon? It would go to the sun. And back, and back, and back, and back, and back 70 times. And that is compressed and coiled inside of you. And all of this stores information. DNA is a, is a book. It, is a, it stores information code. Never mind that it just randomly got there. Never mind who wrote it, how it got inside. How much information are we talking? Just one cell. Okay, let's just talk about one because it's just so, so, so mind-boggling. The conservative estimate of one cell contains 8 billion letters or roughly 500 million sentences in words or 8,000 books. 8,000 books, and that's just one cell. The mathematical probability of this all happening in every one of us over time, continually, for 6,000 years, the mathematical probability is the same as, as if I took, let's just say, a stick of dynamite, and I lit this, and I go driving down the road, and I throw this out my window while going 55 miles an hour, and somehow make it inside apex printing, and it explodes. Oh, just wait. The same mathematical odds are that this explosion, boom, would go up, and the flames, after they died down, the swirling instant explosion would come and land and congeal into this concise dictionary, all 3,000 pages, with every word in alphabetical order, properly defined, and every page numbered without a single mistake. And I'm supposed to believe this is easier to put my faith in than what God's Word says. Do you see why it's important that you have an apologia? Do you see why it's important to say, I, d- God's Word doesn't say that. If we don't know the truth, if we don't hold up to the standard, we're gone. We're the last ambassadors for Him. When He went to heaven, He said, You're it. <laughs> Tag, you're in. Go. Tell the world. Tell them that there's a God who loves you. Tell them about what I did on the cross to pay for your sins, to buy you back. And if that doesn't blow your mind, the fact that it violates the law of probability, that alone, never mind the second law of thermodynamics and several other immutable laws of physics, then maybe you trust the great Bill Gates, who just released this updated statement. He said, DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software 
ever created. It is so ridiculously complex. And God wrote it in each one of you. Over and over. Your unique code. And we need to know that. And we need to be able to share that. This well-founded apologia. The world has to know what you and I possess. They need to know that an infinitely powerful God who did all this, who breathed hot stars into existence, cares for them. And he knows their name. But here's the problem. The enemy wants to say one other slight variation. If he can dream up to say, well, maybe we can come up with a reason to explain our existence just apart from God. What happens is is we really don't need God for creation or for life. And if we don't need God, then that means we can, if we really want to, become untethered from God because he wasn't our creator. And if we don't need to be tethered to God, then we don't need to do anything. And what we can do is we can live our way. And we can live for ourselves, And we can do things that are right in our own eyes. Does that sound familiar at all? It's the same lie the devil has whispered from the beginning in the garden. Did God really say that? You won't surely die. The very first lie. And it's the same subtle one he's saying. God who created the constellations, who plumbed the depths of the sea, who invented oxygen and DNA and laminin and breathed the stars of existence, that same God sees you and notices you and cares for you and went to great lengths so that you could know him. The worst thing we could do is to keep that knowledge to ourselves. I have the greatest secret in the world, but I'm not going to tell you. (laughs) But that's what we do. That's what we do when we sit on this truth. I think it was Penn and Teller, the great atheist, who said, how much do you have to hate someone that you would claim to know the truth and not try to tell them and convince them of your truth? Even an atheist gets it. And we sit on this treasure. And some of us don't even know how to defend it or explain it. And we need to have this apology. God descended all the way down to this little blue marble rolling around the sun. And he lowered himself into the story. He wrote himself into history, making it his story. Descended, took on the flesh of a man so that we could identify and say, oh, he's one of us. Only he wasn't because he didn't sin. He was blameless and perfect. And his beautiful flesh, we'll celebrate in two weeks, was marred and beaten and crucified. An innocent man had to take our place. Do you accept that? That's the gospel. That is pure, unadulterated truth. So you can have a chance to respond today with gratitude. And perhaps maybe for the first time, a prayer of repentance and salvation. If you're here today, or maybe you're listening online, and God is speaking to you, and you've been seeking after God, and you could see just in the 29 minutes here, this this evidence of God who cares for you. If you don't know him, I invite you, I encourage you, I beg you, reach out to him today. It's for your good. I don't get a thing for it. It's not a, no, I don't get an extra paycheck or nothing. This is just for your good so that you could know your creator, so that you could know this one who cares for you. If you want to do that, you can even do that right now. In fact, why don't we do that? Let's pray together, and I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And if God is tugging at your heart, you know who you are because your heart's pounding right now just like mine was the day I met the Savior. Then silently pray along with me right now. In your own words, say, Lord God, I thank you that you didn't give up on me. Thank you for taking notice of me. Out of all the vast and incredible, wonderful things you created, you care for us. And Lord, I confess, just like everyone else here, that I have sinned, that I have done things that I need your forgiveness for, and I pray that you would cleanse me now. Lord, I turn away from my sin. I willfully go 180 degrees the other way. I invite you into my heart, into my life, and I accept your sacrifice, Jesus, on the cross. You paid for all my sins. Not only in the past, but sins I haven't even done. Your blood is sufficient enough to wash me white as snow. God, I turn my life over to you now. Holy Spirit, I ask you to come invade my life. Take control from this day forward. In Jesus' powerful name I pray. Amen.